All right, welcome everybody. Um, I think people are still joining, but uh, uh, we're going to get started anyway. So I am Sarah Hess and I work for the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. And I'd really like to welcome you to this webinar. Um, you can see the title up there on the screen. It's about social media and COVID-19, the results of a global study of digital crisis interaction among Generation Z and millennials. And I'm really just very pleased to welcome my uh, panelists here today who are representatives from the University of Melbourne, Wonderman Thompson and Paul Fish, and you will learn a little bit uh, more about these um, organizations and collaborators as we go along. Um, to start, I'm just going to give a few housekeeping um, rules, so to speak. Um, we have the Q&A, so we have allocated time during this webinar for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, we will then try to address as many as those as we can at the end. Um, if you want to direct your question to a specific speaker, please do put their name in the question and then we, we know clearly who it's intended for. Um, we also have interpretation into French, so if you're joining us on Zoom, you should be able to switch to French if you prefer to listen in French. And it is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. So I will be sharing after this webinar the link to where you can find the recording on YouTube, as well as the slides we will share with everybody who's registered for the webinar. So without further ado, we are going to start um, the webinar and we are actually going to start it with some questions for you as the audience. I'm going to ask my uh, colleague, uh, Catherine, to launch the first poll. And I hope that if you are joining us um, on a computer or a phone, you can um, answer the question that you see on the screen now. Overall, how do you feel about the existence of fake information regarding COVID-19 on social media and messaging apps? And you can answer, I am very concerned, I am somewhat concerned, I am not concerned, I don't know, and I find it interesting. We have quite a few people answering. 75% of the participants have voted on the poll. And this is just so that everybody knows, this is actually one of the questions that we had in this global survey. All right, maybe five, four, three, two, one. Kat, can you show us the results? So overall, we see that the majority of people are very concerned about the existence of uh, fake information regarding COVID. And you will see how these answers align with the uh, results of our survey. We have another poll coming up. So Catherine, can you share the, the, the second poll? So this poll is, how do you react to COVID-19 information shared by others on social media that you know is false? Do you ignore the content, report the content, comment on it? Do you unfollow the person who posted it? Do you share the content or you're not really sure what you do? Again, this is a question that we asked in the global survey. Alrighty, I think the majority of people have uh, voted. Shall we close the poll, Catherine? Okay, so the majority of people ignore the content and about 20% report the content. Um, we do have a number who actually engage and comment on the content. And um, we do have somebody in the chat who said that they um, wanted to correct their answer, but not to worry. Okay, so we're gonna look back on those questions and answers later on um, in the webinar, but I wanted to just give a little bit of background and then introduce um, my colleagues. So I think 
the reason why this um, study is very, very important to us here at WHO, as most of you know and have heard across the media, that this pandemic has been accompanied by what has been coined an infodemic. So a really a significant amount of information, both good and bad, that makes it very difficult for decision makers to actually filter out what is relevant and make decisions that are protective of health. And what's um, very significant is that there is a lot of information both in the digital space and in the physical space. And so during these times of crisis, such as the pandemic, obviously WHO as a global health authority has a significant interest um, in how and understanding how people access their information and interact with their information pertaining to that crisis. And what we see here is that um, young people are a global community with probably unprecedented levels of digital connectedness. And for that reason, that community is the center of the study that we have undertaken. And this it's the results of the study that will help us to inform how we identify successful communication strategies around COVID um, during times like this. And so we were uh, very, very lucky to have the opportunity to partner with the University of Melbourne, who is uh, well known as leaders in research, with Wonderman Thompson, which is a creative agency, consultancy and technology company, and with Polvish, which is a hybrid service sur survey platform that provides uh, professional grade survey research. And so we partnered with um, these entities in order to conduct this global survey. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague um, from um, Polfish, colleagues from Polfish and Wonderman Thompson to talk a little bit about the methodology and technology used. And after this, we're going to go into the key findings um, from the study. So we have from Polfish, John Papadakis, who is the founder and CEO. And from Wonderman Thompson, we have Thomas Brach, who is the chief data officer for the Asia Pacific region of Wonderman Thompson. And Justin Payton, who is the chief strategy and transformation officer, also from the Asia Pacific region. So over to you. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you all for those that are joined today. Uh, it's our pleasure to go through this important piece of research with you. And to we'll start with uh, looking at some of the topics of interest and areas that we wanted to explore and really understand a bit more around how Gen Z and millennials are consuming information and how that information impacts them in their day-to-day -day lives. So we, we start by looking at what sources of information do Gen Z and millennials around the world trust? And how does this vary globally and demographically? What are citizens' perceptions of misinformation? How often do they see it? And how does it affect them? And as we just were asked and answered ourselves, when they are exposed to it, what do they do? And I think you'll find these answers very interesting as we go through them. Are people's decisions and opinions or attitudes related to the information they're exposed to and influenced by it? And do the social media platforms that people use impact their perceptions and behaviors? And then lastly, is there a significant relationship between people's attitudes and what kinds of information they're exposed to or information bubbles that they may be in? And for science skeptics, what types of content might they trust and how might we get through to them? Next slide, please. So let's look at the bedrock of this research, which is a global study conducted over 24 countries to 23,500 uh, citizens aged 18 to 40. Uh, the study is balanced in age and gender and sampling, and the income reflects citizens of those local communities. The time period for this was October 24th to January 7th, 2021. And to understand more around the methodology and the polling service, I'm gonna hand it over now to my partner, John, who's gonna talk a bit more about Pollfish and the survey, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> uh, I would like to um, set what was the methodology for collecting the data uh, for this study. 
Uh, so the methodology was called random device engagement, um, where we use um, a way to reach respondents in the websites and the apps that they already are using. And we uh, engage with them with a great uh, user experience. Um, the benefits of RD uh, include global reach, um, millions of respondents, and the ability to reach real consumers, not necessarily people who are up to date in a panel, but people that, uh, you know, everyday, everyday consumers and, and citizens that uh, were able to capture their opinions. Uh, using RDE, Pulses uh, reached 140 countries and 250 million respondents in 2020. Um, the benefits of RDE and Pulses for, for this study are, 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 are the followings. Um, we are able to reach millennials and Gen Z audiences um, due to the fact of the content where we are we saw the surveys and we, co we collect respondents. And that um, we, we have mobile first, so we've offered a mobile first experience with them with a great user experience. So that way, uh, millennials and Gen Z uh, are actually uh, able to share their time and their focus to, to respond to this research. Um, speed and representability, um, the ability to capture millions of people um, in, in the study, essentially uh, approach millions of people in the study. Um, is able to bring fast results and um, slice and dice the audiences so there is a representative in, in every country. One very important um, uh, benefit is data consistency. We launched the study in 24 countries and almost 24,000 respondents, and we used one user experience, um, uh, one platform, one way of conducting the research. Um, that ensures data consistency across all these uh, samples that we got. Um, another period of, uh, part of this research is uh, that we fold agile techniques. Um, that it means that's the ability to create, edit long surveys based on real-time input. Uh, we offer real-time dashboards and the export the data to power the dashboard that Thomas will share in a bit. Thank you, Thomas. Back to you. So uh, this is Justin speaking at this point with with that I'm gonna I'm gonna try to present some of the top and some of the key findings that came out of this I think the the first thing that I'd like to say it, though is that with 24 countries covered it, it's really hard to do justice to the detail and the nuance and the differences that exist between the markets so so in presenting to you today what I'm going to try to do is outline a few of the a few of the headline insights that came out um, as well as um, identify and, and call out a few of the differences that might have existed between markets. Um, it, what I'd really recommend, as and you'll see this in a minute, we've said it a few times already, we, we, is, is we have put together a dashboard where all of the data exists at a market level. So for those of you in, in different countries around the world, you, you can explore this data and get more detail and more relevance to your local market than what I'm presenting right now. And Thomas will share more details on that in a minute. But, but I think that, that if what I'm gonna to try to share is really six key, key headlines. And I think that the one that obviously stands out first and foremost is, is that when it comes to um, the, the media that, that really has the most trust we are still talking about national mainstream media publications. Uh, when, when we say that, I think that many people probably say, of course, and don't feel surprised. But then when you look at Gen Z and you look at how they consume this and the fact that this, this study was focused on, on social media, I think it's very interesting and noteworthy to say that there's places where people capture a lot of information and there's places where there's a lot of trust of information. And, and that is a really important distinction to make. Now, obviously, there are, there are differences that exist within that. So for example, India, Mexico, Nigeria, they tend to default first and foremost to the WHO's social media channels. Um, Egypt, Indonesia, Russia, South Korea, they, they tend to, to default first to search rather than mainstream media. Uh, in, interestingly, Russia, one step further, they, they tend to, to um, favor information that comes from family and friends, from people that they, that they know. Um, and, and in Turkey, they, they favor social media content, but, but social media content 
that comes from a science or a health expert. So reputation matters quite a bit in terms of where that comes from. So, so I think this is a really important element and, and in some ways very, very reassuring. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can look at, at the types of content that people find to be share worthy. And I think this is, a, again, that the headline may not sound surprising that science content is share worthy. Um, but when you start looking at the numbers and you start looking at how this appears and you look at and you contrast it with what you see on social media, you, you see very quickly that this, this, this does counter the trend. So if you look at the, the content types most likely to be shared, uh, the, the bottom ranking one was Im is, is images at 23%. So those kind of short snackable meme type, type content are actually the things that that, gen, that the Gen Z audience see as least shareable when it comes to um, content around COVID. Uh, on the other hand, content that 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 would force people to to think a little bit further and, and challenges them, the scientific content. That is that is where you saw the the people raising their hand and saying that is what they're more likely to to share um, within within social media. So so that kind of bucks that trend of is it funny? Is it entertaining? Um, and, and it really shows what's there. In, in fact, if we look at markets like Nigeria and Japan, they go a step further and they would say that what, what, they're, what they deem to be most shareworthy is content that's also concerning. Um, so you can start to see the way the, the weightage might go in some markets as far as what gets shared and what doesn't. And, and at the other, on the other end of the spectrum, not really, well, on a different spectrum, you, you've got markets like China where uh, the, the more shareworthy content was 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 content that had already been shared quite a bit. So when they see that content has been shared frequently, has a lot of existing likes, has a lot of existing shares, that is content that uh, that that is seen as most shareworthy. If we go to the the next slide, we we can talk about false news, and this is really where the survey that, that you all just answered comes in. But I, I think that. The interesting bit, and, and you shared some of this yourselves, is uh, is there. So awareness of false news is high, but so is apathy. So I think I think in this group, and my memory is not always perfect, so excuse me if I'm a little off here. But I think in this group there were about 62% of people who said that they were very concerned um, uh, about about fake news, which which feels very much in line with what we're seeing. Now that said, what what we started to see on top of that was the behavior that that came as as a uh, as a result, and and with our survey we saw 35% of people ignoring it, and the quick poll that we did in the straw poll that we did at the beginning of this, I think it was closer to 50. So I think as an audience uh, of this of this group, we tend to to favor ignoring the content more than uh, than than the group who we surveyed. And, and that's quite interesting. Um, I, I think the, the other side of it then becomes, who are the people who take action and, and do something about that? And what we saw was, uh, I think the numbers were roughly in line um, between what we asked you and, and what, what, what our survey came out with, with roughly in, in, this, in the survey, 24% of people saying they report the, the, the content and, and only just over 8% saying they, they unfollow someone who posted that. And I think that, that that's roughly in line with, uh, with, what, with the results of, of, the, of the quick survey we ran with yourselves at the beginning of this. But I, I think that that, that tells us that, that, that there is um, a, a need to, to, to combat fake news more. Because if only, if only 7%, if 30% of people are, are either reporting or, or unfollowing, then we're exposed to a massive amount of fake news. And, and so, so the amount that we, that we are consuming tells us what the volume of the problem is and, and, and really sheds light on that. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, I think that this, this really shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but, but, but I think some of the actions are. Uh, Gen Z and millennials have multiple worries when getting sick um, and beyond getting sick. Uh, obviously there's a massive concern uh, around the economy, um, with globally 53.8% of people focused on the economy and 38, uh, and about 40% of people 
um, concerned uh, about um, unemployment. That economic concern is particularly distinct in Australia, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia, Italy, Morocco, Nigeria, Peru, South Africa, Spain, and Turkey, which is which is quite a number of countries. Um, but but those were the ones that that over-indexed above and beyond uh, above and beyond the others. The 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 top concern in a market like India was employment and 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 unemployment um, and and uncertainty around employment. Um, ranking highest and 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 the financial constraints that came with that of course there were other possible answers that that ranked quite highly as well um, that that leaned in towards more of the mental health elements in fact 33.4 percent of people overall had significant concerns about mental health but when we look at where those come came from um, there were a significant number of people almost 40 percent of people who were quite concerned about the distance that they had in their inability to visit friends and family, 34% uh, who, were, who were quite concerned with uh, just impact on lifestyle and 22% concerned with the, the societal change they were seeing around themselves. So, so I think that there's, there's quite a bit of a varied concern and, and I'd, I'd, I'd encourage people to, to look at their markets and look particularly at the answers to this as, as the answers of what's driving those concerns is quite interesting on a market level. If we go to the next slide, um, obviously the interest in the vaccine is quite high. 55% of uh, Gen Z and millennials uh, are highly interested um, and that differs from the start of the pandemic when there were only 45% of people. So we've seen an increased uh, interest uh, and, and remember the dates of this were, were earlier, so, so that, that may have increased further as, as, the, uh, as the vaccine has started to roll out at this point um, in, in many of the markets that, that we spoke to, not in all, but, but in many. Um, where they get their, their first source was interesting, 42%, 41.9% saying that social media content from the WHO would be their first and, and, and trusted source for content about the uh, about about the vaccine, um, the, the the more interesting thing, and again, I, I I bring this up not because I think it should be shocking, but because I think it is influential in the way we in the way we talk about things when we think about millennials. And there's there's such a trend to think that the way to reach millennials is through celebrity, or is through influencer. But in fact, um, celebrity and influencers did not rank highly as trusted sources when it comes to this sort of information. So, so when we think about how we get that information out there, it's very important to, to think about the, the trust levels that exist in the sources that are helping to, to, to spread that information. If we go to the next slide, um, what we'll see is a really interesting piece, which is, which is obviously that 58% of people are overwhelmed by the information. I think we've all been living through this for quite some time. Uh, the information has changed quite a bit uh, for, for many people um, as they learn more and more. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think that, we're, that, that, that that's shocking as, as we continue to get so much news. But what does come as a shock, uh, potentially to some, certainly did to me, was that 52% uh, of people have just stopped paying attention to news around COVID-19. Um, that almost 60% of people felt the media was not telling them everything. And 57% and of people felt that their government was not giving them the full picture uh, of, of what's there. And again, th this speaks to the need to instill trust and to use the trusted sources that, that are outlined within this research to help um, promote uh, the right behaviors and help to promote um, the, 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 the safest conduct in, in, in each of our markets. Um, the, the interesting side, and I like to end things on a little bit of a, of a, of a positive there, is, well, the stat's not on here, 56.9% of people did feel very optimistic about the future um, and felt that, that a, good proportion, a, a good proportion, a similar proportion felt that things could go back to, to a semblance of normalcy uh, when, when there is a vaccine. So there is a, there is a very high degree of optimism that exists but there is very much a need to maintain vigilance and comply with health guidelines 
um, and, and to promote that as we move forward in order to get there. Uh, that's, that's really just a touch of uh, the information in this survey and, and in the research that we did. Thomas is now going to take you through the dashboard where you can access um, uh, a greater degree of information and he'll show you how that works. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Justin and John. And um, over to you now, Thomas. You're going to oh. share your screen and, and give it a, an update on the dashboard so that everybody can see it. I think um, Ellie has also posted in, in the chat the link to the dashboard so that uh, folks can access it. Um, but I think just before we do that, we're going to um, have one more poll question to get um, everybody engaged again. So Catherine, do you want to launch the last poll question? Great. So here you are. When checking COVID-19 content, I pay specific attention to information which is, and you can select um, all of the answers that apply to you. So do you um, pay attention to information which has a lot of shares, likes, or retweets, is relevant to me, includes or is an article related to an influencer, includes a video, tells a story, is scientific, humorous, concerning, or perhaps you have also stopped paying attention to COVID content. About half the listeners have voted. Okay, we're gonna give you three, two, one, and then let's see what the results are. So we can see similarly to the, the findings of our global survey that the majority of people, um, a vast majority of people actually would like to share con or relate to content that is scientific. Also ranking quite highly there, content that's relevant to you, your context and your person, and then um, videos, images, and infographics. Again, we see a lot of interest as well in information that is concerning. So you can see from these polls that the, um, the what, what was just shared by Justin, the key insights, gives the high level findings of the survey, but once you go into the dashboard, you're able to see the, the depth of the answers um, and information that is available through the, the, the range of answers for each question. So I'm gonna hand back now to Thomas, who's gonna do a quick walkthrough of the dashboard. Thanks, Thomas. Great, thank you, Sarah. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce you to a, a dashboard in a microsite that host the dashboard on the microsite, you can find many of the same infographics that Justin had gone over. And also note that you can also find the raw data. So if you'd like to dig into this data yourself, not only through the dashboard, but get access to the raw data, you can find a link to the raw data here. And I'm sure we'll be sharing out the link and access to the microsite here. But just to spend a moment on the dashboard, uh, I'm first gonna go through a demographic view to give you a breadth of the, the scope of the survey. And you can see up here in the map, a visualization of all the countries that are covered. So we have broad coverage in North America, South America, Africa as well, Europe, Western and Eastern Europe is represented, uh, Asia and Australia. And as mentioned, there is good gender balance and a balance across different age groups. Uh, as well as other demographic attributes such as marital status and number of children. And one of the things that uh, we were highlighting earlier, and you can see in the dashboard as well, <clears throat> is what uh, citizens' concerns might be. Uh, for example, what are their top concerns uh, regarding the pandemic? What are their top concerns in, in terms of how it influences their lives? Overall level of concerns in the pandemic and how they'll be Im impacted? And then in terms of some of the things that we, we talked about earlier, how strongly do they agree or disagree with, with how um, they were reacting within the, the pandemic. And the ability to, to look at this data by 
an individual market. So you can go in and select by country. And by example, see that in Brazil, maybe the top concern there is uh, the economy crashing and how that might vary for another economy or country, by example, the United States. You could also look at it by gender, age group, marital status, monthly income. And one thing that we found was actually influential with some of these questions was the number of social media followers people had. So kind of the breadth of their, their social circles online. Uh, so you can also look at this by consumers and the number of social media followers that they have or friends as well. And we can, <clears throat> again, excuse me, uh, look at that across their concerns and across some of the other questions that Justin went over and that Ingrid will be going over in greater detail, which is sources they trust, social content preferences, social media channels, which information platforms do they look at? And we asked that in a few ways. We asked them at the beginning of the pandemic, at the current state, and this again would have been at the end of last year, beginning of this year, which, and then where they wanna go for information on vaccines. And again, you can look at this by country, age, gender, marital status, monthly income, and number of social media followers. We also looked at the influence or uh, the impact of misinformation, fake news. And we then also wanna look at the role of the WHO. And again, doing this across a wide variety of different attributes of citizens in the communities, by like country, gender, age group, marital status, monthly income, number of followers, and then as well, level of trust in the WHO. So this is an overview of the dashboard we believe in information democracy. So we're democratizing the data by making it available through this, this dashboard. And again, by going to this link here and being able to download the raw data. Now for a deeper set of insights until in the survey and what was found, I'm gonna hand it over to Ingrid. Thank you very much, um, Thomas. And so I'd really like to uh, welcome and introduce Ingrid Volkmer. Ingrid is um, a professor in digital communication and globalization in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. And um, Ingrid is the one who uh, has been looking at this data intensely over the last uh, weeks. And so welcome, Ingrid. And um, we look forward to hearing about um, a more in-depth look at the data and the implications for these of these findings. Over to you, Ingrid. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I'm just trying to bring up my screen. Should work now. Um, yeah, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in, my name is Ingrid Wortmer. So I would like to drill a bit deeper um, into the data set. And in a way, uh, my colleague Justin uh, introduced you to key outcomes, perhaps across the whole data set and I would like to go into some detail and I also would like to address areas where I feel this data could perhaps initiate new debates around platform policies around well what's called fake news and, and those sorts of areas. Um, I just have a, a number of points I want to make given the limitations of time today. Um, I would like to start and coming back to what you already heard it's a global study and I would like to emphasize this because a lot of or not a lot of, but no, a number of studies about COVID-19. Young people are currently being published in national contexts. And we feel uh, that's no longer, well, um, that relevant because uh, young people use globalized platforms and it's time that we understand these new globalized layers of interaction and specifically in a time of crisis. So the countries we've selected were countries which were hotspots according to the de definition by the WHO at the time when we conducted the survey. So in a way, this is in a nutshell, we captured these moments of a heightened crisis and the way how young people in these countries interacted about crisis communication um, in that time period. And that is really important. And these are the, the parameter of our study, um, quite frankly, and they're really important. Um, so, in fact, it's a new, what we would argue, generational specific sphere of globalized health crisis communication. We feel we need to address this from a generational perspective across countries because we see similar what we might call behaviors, information behaviors 
but also similar types of interaction among this young age group across countries. And I emphasize here in this slide across continents. So we can, can no longer talk about the differences between high income, low income countries because young adults in low income uh, countries have access to uh, mobile phones, often to mobile smartphones, are able to interact through social media. And this is, this is a new phenomenon we need to capture and we are capturing in our study. Um, for this generation, health crisis communication, as we said here, is no longer national or regional, but rather is deeply embedded in a well dense globalized sphere of um, digital interaction. In fact, social media platforms constitute what we argue the globalized communication ecosystem for millennials and Generation Z. And that is, in a way, the first layer of our study I would like to uh, talk about now. It's this sort of the platformization as a, uh, a communication infrastructure uh, of this generation across the world. They use a number of platforms. In our study, the average number is five. There are even uh, seven in Nigeria, um, low income country. And we see that you know, um, young adults in low income countries are uh, on the same level concerning in, um, uh, social media infrastructures as uh, their peers elsewhere. Um, and outcomes of our study reveal actually quite interesting patterns of platform use across age brackets, gender, and national context. And what we see is there are different types of platforms being used. Of course, each platform has a different functionality. WhatsApp is more like for um, direct interaction. Facebook is perhaps more for broadcasting uh, issues and Instagram as well. So we need to look at those issues as well. But I think what's quite interesting is that uh, we see different uh, platforms being used. Here is Ni uh, Nigeria, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, in Brazil, it's um, also what's, um, WhatsApp, Instagram, YouTube, and some others. And then in, in Russia, we see Facebook further down and other platforms um, more used than Facebook, like Telegram and TikTok, and et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, is an interesting uh, observation we make, and we want to produce in a report that's going that uh, will be published um, end of April. We want to uh, drill a bit deep, a bit deeper into these platform infrastructures. The outcome of these platform infrastructures and the the dense use of all sorts of platforms, even platforms that are smaller that are not perhaps well known on a global scale, but that are relevant in national or regional context, is that we need to. Um, have more attention by digital policy debates regarding the role of social media as a generational specific sites of health crisis uh, information. And it's not just Facebook. Normally, Facebook is in the center of debates because, of course, Facebook owns um, not just Facebook social media, but also Facebook Messenger, Instagram. Uh, but we feel <clears throat> that uh, there are core issues about corporatization, monetarization of health crisis content, um, new issues we need to address concerning platform governance um, and specifically in times of a global digital uh, pandemic where health data on social media is crucial for this generation and we, we need to safeguard these um, uh, types of um, interaction and, and, and needs for information search on social media and corporatization, monetarization, privacy debates, data harvesting, algorithmic filtering, bots and trolls actually, which are also uh, you know, disrupting interaction. Uh, all these issues need to be looked at, not just for Facebook platforms, but for other platforms as well. And fake news is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that's what we discuss normally in public debates, but we need to drill a bit deeper on this. Um, so Facebook is in the focus of digital debates, but others um, also need to, um, uh, other platforms need to be included. Looking at Nigeria, looking at other low income countries, we might even say, and I'm um, perhaps a bit bold here in my claim that I feel digital divide offers now or reflects now new dimensions which haven't been looked at uh, so far. Um, perhaps uh, social media platforms and messaging apps help uh, young adults in uh, developing countries or low income countries to leapfrog the gaps in other traditional or other infrastructures. Um, and perhaps also what we might see is that there is a, a, a potential gap arising between young adults and older generation in crucial uh, crisis information at times. 
So uh, that's a bit of, of those uh, issues related to platforms. The next uh, issue I would like to raise is health crisis communication. And we see a lot here about um, individualization of uh, health crisis information, what we call individualized navigation across the globalized multi-source environment. So this is a slide that shows you from the dashboard where they go for information. And Justin has mentioned uh, some of this. Um, they go to different sites. They actively search for information. Um, they go to sites of the WHO, international newspapers, national newspapers, uh, and social media content by science and health experts. And that's what we, uh, I must say, we were a bit surprised about the high ranking of the WHO website um, among uh, a lot of respondents. Um, and that is really uh, an interesting outcome of this study. So they, the bottom line is, and I will just skip through the next slides here, um, is that they go to these sites, they actively break out of their, their filter bub bubbles, they actively search for information um, in these times of crisis and uh, WHO plays a major role in this. Uh, sources they trust, I mean, this is sources where they go for information sources uh, they trust, WHO, there's a bit of difference here, science and health experts, so we see this uh, different um, uh, attitudes towards uh, information uh, seeking and then sources they trust are sometimes really different. So that's um, a bit here in Indonesia. We also see that trusted sources are religious leaders. And by the way, uh, in other countries too, for example, in the US, 7% say also they trust uh, religious leaders. Uh, so uh, they actively search for um, information and in a way we argue that they create their own individual crisis narrative through the way they look for uh, information. Everyone, everyone can be a communicator, a follower, an influencer, and we argue these are new types of crisis actors. Governments so far have not made uh, sufficient use of these new roles. I know that in Finland, um, the government has used uh, or works closely with influencers to reach out to um, this uh, young generation, but in other countries that's not the case, and we feel that um, this need to be perhaps increased, that there could be uh, more cooperation with um, uh, young people concerning influencers, but also concerning uh, communities, social media communities, and they could um, cooperate a bit more in those content. Um, information, what they share in their, in their personalized networks, uh, as Justin has already mentioned, is basically um, scientific. That's a, a great preference when sharing, but also is relevant to me, includes an article, is concerning, and so on. So um, uh, content that they share has, in a way, uh, an, a, a meaning or relevance to them personally. And that, of course, explains the peer-to-peer the -peer community and their, their communities of friends. In China, it has um, a, a, a lot of shares, uh, content that is being shared, a lot of shares already, um, is scientific as well, includes an image and so on, um, and uh, similarly in other countries. Uh, follower communities are quite large. Um, a lot have um, between 100 and 1,000 followers, and by these numbers you see the size of their communities, sometimes across the world, uh, but there are also more than 5,000 followers um, by people, by some people in Nigeria, Morocco, uh, South Korea, and India. So that is a, a massive group of people. And you could say they are really crisis actors with so many followers uh, in their communities. Um, we also feel that health communication strategies should consider different types of messages and you know, not just the, just the normal science reports, but perhaps looking at memes and clips to directly engage with these communities. Um, and as I said earlier, we feel that influencers could create uh, messages and could collaborate with governments as well um, in order to um, inform about the crisis. And finally, I would like to give uh, our respondents a, vo a voice in my last slides, because we had one question where we asked, uh, how do you think the WHO could improve communication about the COVID crisis? And here are just four examples. And I, I should add that a lot of people have taken obviously a lot of time and has have thought carefully about what to answer in this question. We have at least, um, I think, 10, 20, uh, 20,000 responses here. More or less everybody has responded. They say here, 
um, more on social media, WHO should buy personal ads to pop up on Facebook and WhatsApp, uh, should approach the subject in a lighter way for a young audience, share information on more platforms to scale up the social media circle, and by partnering with national governments to regularly post updated and standardize the approaches taken across the world. So they have a global perspective and they also want to focus on social media and uh, new types of interaction on these digital platforms. Thank you. Ingrid, thank you so much. And that, that last slide actually answers some of the uh, questions that were coming in. How can WHO use this information um, to inform what we do? And so um, you've alluded to that already. So we can get into, into more of those details shortly, but I want to just um, hand back to Thomas because um, there was one uh, last slide that you wanted to share, Thomas, I believe, on uh, what next with the dashboard and the resources. So over to you, Thomas. Sure, great. So just to where we go next in terms of the microsite and explain further the data and the insights that have been shared, we'll be continuing to flesh out and publish information on that microsite. Uh, we'll be looking at doing deeper behavioral insights. As we saw in the work that Ingrid was just showing, there's a lot of distinction market to market. And we'll be looking at more around behaviors in terms of the social networks that people use. Um, so by example here, when we look at the question trust of government, and we're looking at this visualization here, we can see how different social networks are connected together in terms of clusters of either potentially more skeptics or people that do trust the government as well as looking at which platforms tend to either people gravitate to the do trust or are influencing people more in terms of trust of government and in other institutions and addressing some of the other questions we've seen. Great, thanks Sarah. Thanks very much, Thomas. And thank you to everybody, um, all our panelists here for the, first of all, the wonderful collaboration and then for sharing um, these insights and results and the dashboard. There've been a lot of comments in the chat just saying thank you for, for sharing the dashboard, for making it available and uh, user-friendly accessible. So um, I think that's a wonderful and useful um, tool for everybody to have access to. So we have um, a large number of questions that have come in. And so I'm gonna ask my panelists to keep an eye on the, the Q&A as well, to uh, direct me to questions that they particularly are interested in um, answering as we may not have time to reach them all, but we will try. <laughs> and so, but first um, I think we can, we can start with a question um, that's come in from Mary Bell who mm -hmm. says, is there a correlation between so-called trusted content and the level of misinformation in a country? Who would like to take that question? I'll respond to it, but I'm not sure it will give a satisfactory answer if I'm if I'm very honest here, because while our survey focused and while our, our research focused on um, so-called trusted content, uh, what we did not do was try to uh, benchmark or, or, or in any other way kind of identify differences in terms of the volumes of fake content by market. So, so research into the actual media that is shared and disseminated in each market um, was it was something that was not analyzed in the detail to, to allow us to, to, to give that as an answer uh, in detail. I would just add to that, and I agree that it's hard to measure that in the broader bro different barometers by which one could potentially measure that. But we can look at that amongst the panelists and their perception of exposure to, to the fake news or to misinformation. And um, there is a degree uh, universally of uh, a correlation between the exposure to misinformation and then what what channels people do trust. Um, but what you'll see is that not necessarily by, by um, one country, it's by potentially types of countries and as well by level of income and education. So I would I recommend that you explore the data and what you might find is that countries in, in Africa and, and in South, uh, South America uh, tend to have uh, both higher awareness of potentially misinformation, 
Um, they also, though, have more traditional channels that they trust, including the WHO, uh, multinational news platforms, and even their own government. And in Southeast Asia, you might find um, not only greater levels of understanding of misinformation, but they're much more careful in how they manage mis misinformation, um, as well as likewise having higher levels of trust in institutions such as the WHO, as well as global news platforms, and, and very much so their own government. Hope that helps. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Thomas and Justin. Um, we'll move on to another question, uh, this time from Maria. It would be really interesting to see if people from different regions respond in a similar or different manner. Have you seen regional trends for misinformation, especially between developing and developed nations? Ingrid, you've looked quite closely at the data. Can you speak to any of the regional differences that might have emerged? You're on mute, I'm afraid. Yeah, what's interesting is, I mean, with the uh, fake news, so we said, I mean, what is the awareness and what do you do? And the awareness, it, it, there is no real difference between, let's say, low income and high income countries. I mean, those distinctions perhaps don't matter that much in this world anymore. Um, and people more or less have all, in, in most countries have an understanding or aware of um, fake news. There are some exceptions. And um, some exceptions were South Korea, I think, and Indonesia, um, and a few other countries where there was not so much an awareness of fake news. But then when we asked, what do you do? Then they well, said, well, we do something if we, if we discover fake news. So there are slight differences, but um, we haven't looked at that sufficiently yet across countries regarding fake news. But overall, I mean, it's more or less the case that people are fully aware of fake news. And in some countries, <clears throat> excuse me, like in Russia, where perhaps um, they distrust the government, then perhaps they think fake news slash misinformation uh, we need to be aware of. So the reasons why they are aware of fake news might be different in different countries where perhaps they feel governments um, also um, um, convey misinformation perhaps about the crisis. Thanks very much, Ingrid. Um, a question from Catherine. Um, can the responses be analyzed by racial identity? No. I don't think so. And I don't think that's what we want to do. No. Yeah, we didn't um, ask for that information in the survey. Um, a question. Sorry, Justin, carry on. I was just going to say, it being a global survey, we the 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 racial disparity question uh, doesn't apply in a, a uniform format across every country. So, so we 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 did not spend as much effort looking at that. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, one of the listeners is interested to know whether the respondents were based in urban areas only or were they representative of the entire country? John, maybe that's a polefish question. Um, um, maybe that's more of a Justin and Thomas question. Um, like... Yeah, we saw good representation um, across different, uh, what we, when in China we might refer to as a first tier or second tier city, and in case like South, South Africa, in terms of large metro areas, but <clears> in <throat> areas surrounding uh, those large metro areas as well. So there was a pretty good geographic representation uh, in terms of both a uh, mix of urban, suburban, and in some markets, um, rural, where, where that would matter more. Uh, one a comment from me there is that uh, the respondents follow a natural fall off. Um, so they will follow a natural uh, representation of the geolocation as well, unless specified. Thanks, John and Thomas. <clears throat> um, a question from Daniel. One topic that comes up a lot in conversations in my area is digital fatigue. Do you have results that speak to the change of people's behavior on social media platforms? Is it more or less during COVID? Did the avalanche of COVID information, but also advertisers, 
cause a change in engagement rates? It's not something we looked at specifically, I think, but maybe you want to make some comments on that. Well, I was going to say, we did, we did a survey at a, at a singular point in time. So, so the results reflect a, a moment in time rather than a, a, a one-year differential. But what we did ask uh, as specific questions was, was what people are doing. And there were specific comments about uh, people now ignoring the 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 news and ignoring commentary about covid and choosing to do that and and those comments were <clears throat> from people who who were engaged at one point in time so while i can't speak to uh comments about advertisers uh while i can't comment on on the behavior to specific platforms what we can say is that there is a there is a significant demographic um, and a portion of the demographic uh, across markets who have uh, topic fatigue, we'll call it that for lack of a better term right now. And so uh, effectively are, are, are numb or don't listen to the topic or to, to, tune it out. Thanks very much, Justin. Um, I'm gonna hand back to uh, my panelists for uh, some closing thoughts and, and comments shortly, but there was a question for me, which was, uh, what is the practical impact of this information shared by WHO and who will be the top users of the insights? Um, and so for us, it was a, a, I think I alluded to it briefly in our, in my opening remarks, but it's a really important um, subject area, particularly for us uh, working in the risk communication, community engagement area of the um, COVID pandemic. I think, what we would really like is for at a, at a country level, WHO um, countries, um, country offices to be able to um, use this information together with uh, national health authorities when thinking about the information that they're putting out in terms and the audience that they want to reach. I think one of the things that Ingrid spoke about, which I think is a, a significant um, area of interest is really that understanding that there are um, young people out there who, in the traditional sense of the word, um, are not social media influencers, but actually in this highly connected space of the digital world, they are influencers because they have, you know, several thousand followers and they're just an ordinary person. And so tapping in and, and to, to those, those types of, of individuals, enabling them, partnering with them, I think is a, is a really interesting um, thing to explore at a, at a country level. So how can the ordinary person become a, an advocate for science-based information sharing? So I think that's really something that we'd really like to explore. Um, I know we're almost at time and so I'm going to just um, go uh, around the the group to see were there any questions that you wanted to answer specifically or any uh, final comments and I'm going to start with Justin. So so I, I think first of all I'm really encouraged by the number of questions and I'm always sorry that we don't get to answer all of them. Um, I feel like with any good piece of research there's always more questions that come out of it as a follow-up of what you could ask and what you could do. And, and so there are many that, that come that and exist, such as how do people recognize fake news? And, and this, uh, we, we didn't explore exactly how do everybody, how does everyone recognize that? Are they accurate in their recognition of fake news, et cetera? There's a huge amount of work that could be done in that area. And I think that the, the, the topic is massively important. I think that the recognition that we're seeing from people and the awareness that we're seeing from people is massively important. And what I am encouraged by uh, is that when we look at millennials and Gen Z, that, that they have an awareness of media and an awareness of fake news that keeps them alert to it. And I think that uh, when I look at other generations, I think that, that we may not have been trained to be as skeptical to media, uh, and, and certainly that reflects my generation. But I, I think that with anything, there's always uh, there's there's always more questions that come out of something like this. But but I think it, it helps to guide the right questions. So uh, hopefully we've answered some for you, Sal. So. Thank you, Justin. Um, Thomas, anything from you? I think 
Justin summed it up wonderfully. I would just uh, advocate people go and take a look at the microsite, look at the dashboards, and uh, continue to look for updates. I think this is a great initial view into the data, but there's so much more to explore. And let's definitely take a look at the raw data as well. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tom, Thomas. Um, John, anything from your side? Um, yeah, I agree with both Justin and Thomas. I'm very um, happy that we are offering all the data. Uh, so essentially we open source this study. Um, obviously um, the, the reports that, that will come from Ingrid uh, will be um, really something to, we're waiting for. Uh, but anybody that has wants to dig in a specific segment, they're more than welcome to download them and, and take the results from themselves. Um, so um, I find this is an extremely important in such a significant topic as the one we're covering here. Thanks, John. And Ingrid? Yes, um, uh, I must say I was most impressed by the way how uh, WHO ranks prominently uh, across the world among this age group. It clearly shows that there is digital literacy in place and um, they know how to break out of their filter bubbles. Um, they know how to, well, to some extent to deal with fake news. I'm a bit worried about the way how we discuss in public debate fake news because I feel it's a bit... Um, uh, too focused on uh, on certain phenomena while we hardly address these other types of disruptions, as I said earlier, bots, trolls, algorithmic filtering, uh, etc. We hardly discuss the monetization of social media platforms. Um, and these are the major sites for this generation. So I think much more needs to be done specifically in times of a global health crisis. So I feel there are a lot of outcomes of this study for digital policy, perhaps even digital policy for the WHO to look at health crisis in those areas. Uh, we also sh no sh um, should look at um, search sites. We haven't really addressed that in this discussion today in this webinar, but search sites also rank prominently as uh, we have addressed and my colleague Justin mentioned that too in this key insight overview. And we, we don't address search sites sufficiently in digital policy. Google uh, ranks of course uh, on top now um, uh, results regarding COVID uh, from uh, formal health organizations or national governments, but other search sites, there are a zillion other search sites that don't do it. So I feel there is another uh, gap here. So let's not get distracted just with looking at fake news. There are numerous issues that I think come out of this study for digital policy in all sorts of areas that really need to be addressed. Thanks very much, Ingrid. And um, that just leaves me to say thank you to everybody who's joined us today, who took part in the questions, the polls, and who submitted their questions. And um, please do take, take a look at the, the microsite and the dashboard and um, um, there's likely to be updates in this space. Um, most imminent, I guess, is the, the full report that Ingrid is working very hard on um, anyway that will be coming in the next couple of months. Um, so thank you to everybody, and I do wish you a really uh, safe rest of the day wherever you are. Very late in your end of the world, Ingrid, but... No, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody, and take care. Thanks. Thanks.